Guys, just to introduce our, our subject for tonight, I want to share with you that when I was a kid, we played a game, and it was really a demented game. It was a game that a lot of young girls would not play, but a, a lot of young knucklehead jock boys like myself would play. And the objective of the game was one thing. It was to inflict pain on each other to the point of causing one another to say a word. And the word that we tried to get each other to say was the word mercy. And we called the game mercy. Did anyone ever play this? I don't even know who came up with this game. But we would play that game. I'm like, what? Looking back on it, it's like we did some weird stuff. But listen, here's what's amazing about this game is that that was the only context that I had for the term mercy. So in that sense, I never wanted to say the word mercy, and I wanted to actually stay away from it. Saying mercy meant that you were a weak person, that you had tapped out. Now, what about you? When you think about mercy, be honest, what comes to your mind? If you're a football fan, this is a great week in America, because college football starts on Saturday, and the NFL starts next week. Hey, what do I need? Oh. Yep, those out of the way. Thank you. So football is firing up, and there's a football player for the Houston Texans. He's a linebacker, which the linebackers are the biggest, toughest guys, and his name is Merciless. I've always thought that's so hilarious. I don't know. Yeah, Whitney Merciless. And he's just like, oh, like you don't want to mess with this guy. So for me, when I think of Mercy, I think of that guy. I also think of the Christian rock band Mercy Me. Great band, good, some good music. I don't know what you think of, but here's the thing. At the end of the day, it really doesn't matter what I think about the term mercy or even what you think about the term mercy. What matters is what the Lord Himself thinks about mercy. And so I want you to turn in your Bibles over to Matthew chapter 5. And perhaps tonight, our understanding of this term, this loaded and potent term mercy, is going to be helped maybe confronted, maybe changed as we see the Lord Jesus unfold for us this next beatitude in our list within the Sermon on the Mount. So we're in the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 5. And I actually want to start in verse 1 to get a running start once again. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Seeing the crowds, He went up on the mountain. And when He sat down, His disciples came to Him. And He opened His mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Well, as we've been discussing tonight, gang, we're going to look at this term, mercy. And just as a little bit of a context setter, you need to know Matthew was one of the disciples and Matthew wrote for an express purpose of portraying Jesus as the king. Jesus is the coming king. Each gospel writer portrayed a different aspect of the Lord Jesus and Matthew's focus was that he was a king. And what's interesting is that he also then comes to talk about mercy more than the rest of the writers. So if you look at Matthew chapter 9, just to, again to get a little bit of context, in, in Matthew 9, he's sitting with these tax collectors and sinners, it says in verse 10, and the Pharisees came and they say, hey, disciples, why is your teacher, this guy Jesus, why does he eat with sinners and tax collectors? And Jesus responds with brilliance, and he says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Jesus said, I desire mercy. That is to say, compassion plus action, as we'll see. Matthew is speaking of mercy. Same chapter down in verse 27, Jesus passed on from there and two blind men followed him, crying aloud, have mercy on us, son of David. Now think about it. What's Matthew portraying about Jesus? Jesus is the what? The king. And so Son of David was a messianic title for the coming King of Israel. Unique to Matthew's Gospel, you see this phrase, Son of David, over and over. In fact, look at chapter 15, chapter 15, verse 22. Once again, Jesus went away from there and withdrew, in verse 21, to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from the region came out, and she was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, Son of David. Why? 
because my daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. So she calls out to the king, not only of Israel, but of the whole universe, Lord, would you heal my daughter? In Matthew chapter 20, two times you have this occurrence. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 30, Jesus is going to heal two blind men, but first they come out in verse 30 and they say, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And then they say it again in verse 31, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. A cry to the king for mercy. And finally, if you back up two chapters to the left, chapter 18, it ends this parable of the unforgiving servant, which we'll look at a little later on. Chapter 18, verse 33. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? So guys, when Jesus opens up, he's actually probably at the bottom of the hill on the northern seashore of the Sea of Galilee. And he's got a crowd of about 5,000 around him with his 12 disciples sitting front row. When Jesus opens up and he says this beatitude, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. There's a whole truckload of force behind that statement. And it's my hope tonight to help us dig into that and understand exactly what Jesus is saying and exactly how it applies in our life today. So go ahead and go back to Matthew chapter 5. And I think that the first order of business, even still by way of introduction, is to just ask and answer, what is mercy? (laughs) What is mercy? Aside from a weak confession from a little boy who's been pinched enough to say, mercy, mercy, what really is biblical mercy? Well, here it is. Mercy, and I'll show you how we get this as we go, but mercy is to feel pity on someone in need and then to do something about it. It's, it's to feel pity or compassion and then to do something about it or to take action. So we could put it this way. It's compassion plus action. Are you with me? That's what mercy is. It's compassion plus action. And I think this is best exemplified in the story of the Good Samaritan. You have several even religious people that pass by this person in need of help on the side of the road. Right, One religious leader and another religious leader. And yet it's the Samaritan of all people who not only looks by and has compassion. It's one thing to have compassion, but then to keep walking. But what does the good Samaritan do in Luke chapter 10? He stops and he ministers. He helps. It's compassion plus action. Well, the next question still to understand mercy we could ask is how do mercy and grace differ? How are grace and mercy different, or are they the same? Well, here here it is. Grace answers to those who are undeserving. Mercy answers to those who are miserable. Catching the difference? Grace is more on the blessing side. Mercy is more on the relief side. Grace deals with the sin and the guilt itself. Mercy deals with the consequences of sin. Or we could say it this way. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Blessing. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve, the withholding of punishment. Mercy, in a sense, seeks to minister relief. Relief. Well, third and finally, just to understand mercy, how is mercy dispensed? How do you see it in action? And really, guys, you see mercy find its home in two places, two ways that mercy is demonstrated or expressed. And the first is this. It's the feeling of pity and the consequent action that follows towards those who are in a desperate place in their physical life. Those who have a need. Those who are suffering. right? Those who are in an unfavorable or difficult circumstance. It's pity plus action for those who have a legitimate physical need. Think with me here. James 1.27 James, the author of that book under the inspiration of the Spirit, says, Pure and undefiled religion is this. What's it say? Care for widows and orphans. Pure and undefiled religion is this. Care for widows and orphans. That is an expression of mercy. Back in our Old Testament, in Psalm chapter 82, Psalm chapter 82 and verse 3, he says, Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. This is a picture of mercy being given to those who have a physical need. Those who are in an unfavorable circumstance, in a miserable and totally 
hopeless and helpless state. Isaiah chapter 1, we have another example in verse 17. He says, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause. So think with me here, gang. God's heart is merciful toward the widows, toward the orphans, toward the weak, toward the hopeless and helpless. And his heart is that we would be the same way. Now, let's pause for a moment. Do we see this kind of mercy in the world? (laughs) Is this common? Do people naturally tend to demonstrate and express this kind of mercy? I think the quick answer is no. Right? Most people actually shy away from any sort of pain and suffering and affliction of people out there. You might see the ad on your Instagram come up. You might see the news article, but within 30 seconds, you've already swiped on. And though you, you, you felt a moment of compassion and pity, certainly there's typically no action that's followed. We're on to the next thing. We're on to the game. Whatever the results of the game were yesterday, whatever the next clip may be. Now, you can think about this guy what you want, but hey, Tim Tebow is at least a man who not only has compassion, but that compassion is driven to action. It's fun to follow him. I I started following him on Instagram just because of his football career, but he's a professing Christian, and one of the things I appreciate that he's doing is he started a ministry that's helping the sex trafficking issue that is a global pandemic. He's actually doing something to help those who are weak and defenseless and have been caught up in a very wicked and evil system. Along these same lines, guys, I would say this, is that most of American missions trips are not really missions trips. And what I mean is a lot of the times you have a group of kids, high school or college students, that go overseas somewhere or down to Central America and they go and they do something nice. They build an orphanage. They, you know, minister to the hungry. They do something. And, and a lot of times our sort of circles would look at that and say, well, that's not really a mission strip. And maybe it's fair. Maybe the, the gospel's left out. But listen, those aren't all bad if they're doing something to help someone who's in a genuine and desperate need, especially if they're doing it in the name of Jesus and seeking to minister the gospel. Maybe we'll just change the name. We'll call it a mercy trip. We'll call a mission trip something that's gospel-centered, and we'll call this a mercy trip. But in any case, what I want you to know tonight is that God desires us to have mercy like He has mercy. And the first expression of that is feeling pity and taking action toward those who are in a desperate place physically. Now, what do you think the second manifestation of mercy is? If I'm emphasizing the physically, well, here it is. The second demonstration of mercy that God wants us to have, Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, it's this. It's feeling pity and taking action with those who are in a desperate place spiritually. That is to say, those who have sinned. Mercy manifests itself towards sinners by showing forgiveness. Forgiveness is a second manifestation of mercy. Think about it with me. If you're driving along in your car and you come up on a car with its flashers on and you notice smoke billowing out of the hood and you you pull up and you slow down just in time to see a mom get out of the driver's seat, rip open the back door and begin trying to get the child out of the car and now the car has caught on flames, you're going to feel something in your heart, yes? Hopefully compassion and pity. And God help us if we don't then pull over our car and jump out and begin to help this mom get her child out of the car. Are you with me? This is a demonstration of mercy of the first order. But it's really no different than when someone sins against us. And why do I say that? Well, in the same way, when someone sins against us, instead of being personally offended and personally hurt, we ought to, again, have a sense of pity for them. Why? Because in this instance, they've been caught up in sin, they've been deceived by sin, they've been trapped by sin, possibly even consumed by sin, and oftentimes we're actually just the casualty amidst their situation with God. You see, a a, a secure person, a person whose identity is secure with God is able to look at that, and when they're sinned against, actually to give mercy, to feel pity for the person, and then to be moved to action, which is to either forgive or to overlook the sin. So few Christians, though, are effective disciples, and so few Christians are effective counselors because they're far too easily offended. They lack mercy toward sinners. 
So this is all background, guys. Look back at Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 7, Blessed are the merciful. That's what we're talking about. I just wanted us to understand this concept of mercy from the Bible. And so tonight, really, now I just want to implicate and, and give you one main point, one big idea, and it's this. It's that those who recognize their great need and get mercy ought to be, or really they are, those who have pity toward others and give mercy. Let's work through this just in two points. First, let's look at those who have received mercy, and we know this to be Christians. The most countercultural and disruptive truth of the Bible is that you and I and everyone else are not good. (laughs) In fact, we're quite bad. The Bible says from the very beginning all the way through all of mankind's history, even up to today, that we have hearts that are wicked. We are profoundly depraved of any ability to do good and reach out to God. We are sinful by birth, by nature, and by practice. And so as we read through the Bible and we see sinful action after sinful action, disbelief after disbelief, we're really seeing a mirror of our own hearts, are we not? Guys, listen, it's easy to look at Israel, isn't it? And say, oh my goodness, what are you guys doing? How could you, I mean, come on. He, God just did a miracle in your midst. How did you already forget? How did you already forget what he did? You're Really, Israel, you're going to doubt? Really, you're going to mistrust? You're going to turn to another God? Well, listen, guys, before we're quick to cast the stone, let's examine our own hearts. How are you doing lately with trusting the Lord amidst now a year and a half of COVID? How are you doing in trusting the Lord with all this going on in Afghanistan right now? How are you doing in trusting the Lord with the trial in your life, the people in your life, the difficulty with your work, your family, your job, your friends? We're not that different. We're not that different from the Israel that we read about all through the Old Testament. Why? Because our hearts are wicked. Our hearts are wicked and deceitfully depraved. We're sinful We struggle, we're prone to wander. And yet, here's this profound good news. (laughs) Same thing we've been talking about. God looks upon our pathetic state and he feels something. What is the emotion? God is a God of emotion. What is the emotion that God feels? Something I already said. He feels pity. Pity. And that pity then drives him to action. In 2 Corinthians, just to show you one demonstration of this, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. God is the Father of mercies, which may mean that He is the originator of all mercy. True. It may mean that He's the one from whom mercy flows. Also true. It may mean that he's the God who is merciful, also true. But the fact is, is that mercy is accompanied with comfort. And verse 4 says, who comforts us in all of our affliction. God looks upon our sinful state. He feels pity and he is moved to action. And you might ask, well, how does God show us mercy specifically? What does that look like in my life as a sinner? Ephesians 2, verse 4, right in the paragraph that is maybe the most profound gospel paragraph in our Bible, Ephesians 2, verse 4, it says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, what did He do? He made us alive. (laughs) He made us alive. Why? Because He was rich in mercy. He looked upon our sinful state, He felt pity, and He was moved to action and that action was to quicken our dead hearts. 1 Peter 1.3 says the same thing, that according to His great mercy, He's caused us to be born again to a living hope. Guys, God demonstrates His mercy by causing you to believe, by providing the way of salvation when He didn't have to do that. God is a God of mercy. James chapter 5 and verse 11 James reminds us of the example of Job. And he says, You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. James 5.11 Even in our trials, we see from Job that God is there with us, and He brings us out of them because of His great mercy. 
So how does God show us His mercy? Well, He saves us. He comforts us. He brings us through trial. But to what extent, you might wonder, have you and I received mercy? Did we just need it once? Did we just need a small dose of it? Just a quick shot and we're fixed? What level of pity have we required from the Lord? And what level of action did God take? Well, how much mercy did we need? I might just say a pile of it. (laughs) A lot of it. In fact, the most that you can possibly comprehend. To say that we were in an unfavorable and miserable state is the understatement of the year. From the moment we could yell... (laughs) which was actually when we were quite little, we were angry and rebelling against the God who made us, even as small children. We were born with an angry heart, and that anger didn't go away. Up through those years of three years old, and five years old, and seven, and nine, eleven, in your teenage years, every one of us had anger toward our parents, anger toward God, frustration, pride, selfishness. Ultimately, we were unfaithful to our Creator who made us for a purpose, We were really, just as Israel was called, prostituting ourselves out to other loves and other lovers besides God. And to add to this, He blessed us all the while. He was gracious to us. He gave us life and food and shelter and good things. And very seldom did we stop and say thank you. In fact, just a couple nights ago, I read the story in our kids' story Bible of the ten lepers. And it was a good reminder to me. How many of the lepers did Jesus heal? Ten. And how many came back to say thank you? Just one. Nine out of the ten wanted Jesus for what He could do for them, not for who He was. Whatever the most amount of mercy is that you can imagine, we've received even more than that. So watch this, guys. Back to Matthew chapter 5. It's only those who have received mercy who are called blessed or accepted or congratulated on God's part. It's only those who have received mercy who are true kingdom citizens. Are you with me? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now, I think we could ask and answer yet one more question, still under this first consideration of those who have received mercy. And we could ask, how do you receive it? How do you receive mercy? How do you get to this place of being called favored or accepted or congratulated or blessed? And he says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. How do you get there? Well, the answer is you look back up just a few verses. There's a very strategic and purposeful order here, is there not? Jesus begins by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. That is to say, you must view yourself as spiritually bankrupt. Second, he says, blessed are those who mourn. It's one thing to recognize, oh man, I'm broke, Lord. I don't got anything in my bank account. But then it's another to be sorrowful over it, to be mourning over our sin, to be grieved by our sin. Lord, I bring nothing to the table and I'm sorry for my sin, God. I've offended you. These two together produce an inner attitude that we call the meekness, right? Meekness toward God and meekness toward man. There's a gentle and controlled disposition because of being poor in spirit and mourning over sin. But meekness is not weakness. It's not apathy. It's not laziness. It's followed up by blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The meek person is not just a little quiet sheep, but it's a tamed lion who's still viciously hungry, but for the right thing for righteousness, and thirsty for righteousness. There's actually aggressive pursuit. Well, it's these four things that precede the one then who is merciful. You don't just put on mercifulness, right? You don't just say, I'm going to be a merciful person today and crank that out in the flesh. A merciful person is one who's been transformed from the inside out because of these prerequisites. To say it another way, mercy is a byproduct of being poor in spirit and mourning over sin and having a meek disposition and hungering and thirsting after righteousness. So this one, this one will be merciful and only this one. Guys, just as a final note and reminder on this point, mercy is never natural. (laughs) Mercy is not natural. Sure, a tyrant king may choose not to kill one subject in that moment, but that's not God's kind of mercy. Mercy is not natural to mankind. It is only from the inner working of the Spirit of God. So, before one can ever be 
happy, before one can ever be blessed and accounted as favored and congratulated in God's eyes, well, they first must receive mercy. Christians then have received mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. The second half of this, though, is just as important. And just the the second and final point I want to share tonight in in fleshing out this one main point is that Christians then likewise give mercy. If we've received mercy in abundance, then we're going to see how could we not then give mercy. That's why I'm saying it's those who recognize their great need and get mercy that turn around and have pity toward others and give mercy. Go over in your Bible to Matthew chapter 18 because this is the most profound example of this, I think, in all the Scriptures. Matthew chapter 18 As I was assigned this from Derek, looking at blessed are the merciful, immediately my mind thought of this passage because it just is such a vivid story and yet at the same time, profoundly pertinent and relevant for our lives today. Matthew chapter 18, Peter has just asked, Lord, if my brother's going to sin, how often should I forgive him? Seven times. And Jesus says in verse 22, I do not say to you seven times, but... 77 or even 70 times seven times therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants when he began to settle one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents that's a lot of dough by the way millions and millions and millions of dollars in contemporary currency verse 25 and since he could not pay his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made so the servant fell on his knees imploring him have patience with me and i will pay you everything and here's our word and out of pity for him the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt what an act of mercy. There was a feeling of pity followed by a subsequent action. He forgave him the entire debt. Verse 28, but when the same, but when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him just a hundred denarii. Much, much, much less. Let's say it this way. A talent would be a year's wage. A denarii would be a day's wage. So we're talking just a hundred days worth compared to 10,000 years worth. Well, he took this one who owed him a hundred denarii and the text says he was seizing him and he began to choke him. My goodness. Saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. Look familiar? The same cry for mercy. Verse 31, when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt, which by the way, he would never pay. And here's the punchline, verse 35. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Here's what the Lord would have us know from this. Just two things. First of all, our sin before God, listen, isn't this true? Our sin before God is greater than any sin that anyone will ever commit against you. Amen? Guys, it's so much greater, we can't, even, we can't even do a chart comparison here. It's infinitesimally small compared to how infinitesimally great our sin is against a holy God. Our sin before God is greater than any sin that anyone will ever commit against us. Now listen, that's not to do away with the fact that people can sin. And they can sin in really hurtful and damaging ways that, ah, that, oh gosh, they leave scars sometimes, right? But it's still nothing in comparison to how we've sinned against God. And the second truth that I want to point out is that those who have recognized God's great mercy toward them are compelled to give mercy to others. It just is. It's almost as if it's a law of nature that the Lord Jesus is teaching all throughout this Gospel of Matthew that when you've understood God's mercy, you pass it forward. 
You pass it forward. It comes down from God. It ministers to your heart and it flows out of you to other people. We find then from the harmony of all the Scriptures that the one who does not forgive a sinning brother actually manifests a lack of understanding of how grace and mercy work in their life from God and thereby they demonstrate that they're unsaved. An unsaved person shows no mercy and no grace. And the reverse is true. A saved person shows mercy and grace. So, return to Matthew chapter 5. We'll read this once more. This immortal Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is opening up with the most profound introduction of any homily, any speech, any message ever given. And so it's proved to be true once again. Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Guys, Christians are declared here as being merciful. And yet, I have to just even be introspective and ask, why are we so bad at it then? Why are we so bad at doing this very thing that we are positionally called? He, notice he doesn't say, blessed are those who show mercy once in a while. He doesn't say, blessed are those who can give mercy when needed. He actually just qualitatively said, blessed are those who are categorically called merciful. It's a description of their being. Why are we so bad at being what we are? Right? Think with me, guys, about an instance where someone showed you mercy. Do you remember? Maybe you sinned against someone and you went to them and there's nerves and you're uneasy about it and you're nervous and you're kind of sweating a little bit. Oh, sorry. You're kind of sweating a little bit. You're nervous. And then in that instant, they forgave you. They gave you mercy. It's like cool water to a parched soul, right? There's a, there's a healing balm of someone who's gracious and meek and merciful. And yet, if you've experienced that, my question is, why do we not do that to people more often? It seems as, as often the case, when we have the opportunity to be merciful, Instead, we go like this and we want to hold them under our thumb and keep them right there. And now I've got something over you and I've got you and I'm going to let you, rem- I'm going to remind you of this next time I need to. May it never be. Gang, we're really following our first father, Adam, right? We're, we're acting more like Adam than we are like Christ in that moment. And I think what God would have us know from this is that, listen, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And we could really turn it around and say, it's those who have really received and contemplated and meditated and lived in the mercy that they've received from God who then turn around and give mercy out generously. Mankind doesn't do this. Natural man doesn't do this. In fact, mankind is actually quite brutal. Are you with me? Mankind kills one another. They don't forgive one another. They don't want to enter into people's problems. They see people's hurts and they insulate, they isolate from people's hurts. The world doesn't want to enter pain and suffering. They want to hold it from an arm's length away. In fact, the world not only is not merciful, but the world is brutal. Brutal. Think about Jesus, who was, in fact, the most merciful person to have ever lived. All day long, he went about ministering to people's needs, forgiving and healing. He healed people, often with no thanks in return, even as I cited. And yet, was mercy returned for mercy? Not in the least. Not in the least. And in the same way, mankind doesn't either. Jesus is saying then that the kingdom of God literally belongs to those who are merciful. True kingdom citizens are those who are merciful. And it's so rare, it's so rare, get this, that in the end times, in that great tribulation time, when God's wrath is being poured out upon those who dwell on the earth, it will be so simple to see who's born again and who's not in this day. You want to know how? (laughs) Hey, Gary, here's a cup of water. You're welcome. And by that act alone, Jesus says, I can tell who's a believer and who's not a believer. A cup of water given in my name will not go unnoticed. So if if you find that you're lacking mercy, God 
Help us to turn and repent. Guys, I want to help us uh, just to learn to live. Look at the bottom of your sheet there. Two things that I think would be uh, fitting action items for us. Two ways to walk it out throughout this next week and Lord willing, the rest of our lives. And the first is this. Meditate on the mercy of God towards sin and sinners. Meditate. Chew on this mercy. Listen, gang. First question is this. Do you know God's mercy? Have you received His mercy? Or are you just walking uh, through the, the hoops, so to speak, riding the coattails of your parents' religion instead of actually personally crying out to God and personally receiving mercy in your soul? And if you have received mercy, do you cherish it? Do you dwell on it often? Do you thank God for mercy? Meditate on mercy often. And second, consider your disposition. Consider your heart. Are you a merciful person? Not do you give mercy once in a while and then a pat on the back, but I'm saying, are you a merciful person? Is it your natural tendency to meet a need when you see someone in a desperate state physically? And is it your natural disposition to show kindness and forgiveness toward those who sin, even those who sin against you? Consider your disposition toward others and whether or not it is merciful. Merciful people quickly forgive. They keep short accounts. They, as God does, take sin and they separate it as far as the east is from the west. Is that what you do when someone sins? Or do you keep it right next to that person so that at the next opportune time you can remind them of that sin? Do you take sin and do you put it at the bottom of the ocean like God did our sin? Or do you like to keep their sin right at the surface? The next time they start to flirt with it, you remind them. Guys, merciful people don't do that. They extend grace and compassion and forgiveness because they understand, Lord, I've required so much more, even this week. The big idea is that those who recognize their great need and get mercy are those who have pity toward others and give mercy. Would you bow with me as we close in prayer?